Okay. Um, one of the things that, so talking about blood tests now, it's exactly the same um, uh, sort of process with that. You know, they only tell you about likelihood of allergy. All right. So one of my jobs when I was with the BSACI writing the milk allergy guideline is to look at all the data for blood tests. All right. So it's a very complicated slide, but actually all you need to look at is here. Okay. So these are the actual results from blood tests. And what it tells you to diagnose an allergy, your blood test ha value has to be between 5 and 88. Yeah, so where's your cutoff? Yeah, I, I don't know. All we can say is that s smaller values are re more relevant in younger children and higher values are probably more relevant in older children. But actually, there's no cutoff that says a yes or no answer. So again, it's about talking to the patient. So after I've finished uh, those three aspects, I'll have three outcomes. This is definitely a food allergy, and I'll talk about avoidance. This is definitely not a food allergy, and you can go away and eat. Or I'm not really sure, and that's when I'll be doing food challenges. And our food challenge is the gold standard. All right, So we give a graded uh, portion of the food over a few hours, with the final, the final dose being a suitable portion of that food for that age of child. Obviously, if there's a reaction at any point, we stop. And if they get right through to the end, that confirms that this child is not allergic. And again, parents are often worried about this, because um, sometimes I see parents quite late on in the process. They've been told to avoid something for so long that even, even if I say, oh, you could introduce it at home, I'm quite happy for you to do that. They'll say, oh, no way. We won't do it in the hospital. And, and we will do that for them, because at the end of the day, I can understand the anxiety around something you've avoided for such a long time. So, the management options, the most useful person to have in your clinic is not me, but actually the dietitian. all right? The dietitian goes to avoidance in great detail. And actually, if it, this is just a slide. This side contains milk, that side doesn't. Yeah, they look almost the same. Yeah, so that's what I say. So shopping for foods is really, really difficult. And like Scott was saying, until you actually have to go out and do it, you don't realise, because uh, we put those together, and I just thought, I, would know, I wouldn't have a guest. In fact, custard doesn't contain milk, but one bird's custard doesn't, one does. <laughs> okay, so let's think about avoidance a little bit. So this is Tyler, who's four months old. He was referred to the allergy clinic. He's been breastfed and started on formula milk for one week. Mother noted that in the preceding 24 hours, there had been swelling of the hands and feet. He was miserable, he was quite unsettled, and he was seen in the uh, A&E and developed urticaria in the waiting room. He was given an antihistamine and improved, and because he improved, it was a long wait, parents went home and went to see the primary care physician. What do you think you should recommend regarding avoidance? All right, in this child. So your choices are breastfeed, uh, mum continues dairy. Breastfeed, mother avoids dairy. So go for a soy milk formula, uh, extensively hydrolyzed formula, amino acid formula, goat's milk, or none of the above. If you say that, then you have to tell me what you can give instead. <laughs> All right. So who, who's going to go for A? A few people, yeah, OK. Uh, uh, B? Yeah, okay, a few people want to go for B, yeah, okay. Uh, C, soya milk, all right, a few people soya milk. Uh, uh, EHF, extensively hydrolyzed formula, do you know what that is? Some no's, okay, we'll come back to that then, okay, okay, thank you, Andy. An amino acid formula, okay, a few, okay. Does everybody know what an amino acid formula is? No, okay, we'll come back to that then, okay. Nobody wants to go for goat's milk or none of the above, okay. Okay, so I agree with uh, most of you, breastfeeding absolutely is a gold standard. That's what we continue to do, all right? Now, uh, depending on what the history was before, this child was tolerating this breast milk before and mum was having milk in a diet. So I wouldn't tell her to stop milk in this occasion. Had the child been unsettled, miserable for a prolonged period, started on formula milk and then got worse, then I would have probably told mum to avoid uh, dairy in her own diet. So it really depends on the history, again, talking to the patient. So the only time we would stop breastfeeding is at the time or age of infant that mum decides to do that. Okay, so that's her decision. If they're symptomatic on breast milk, as we've already explained, um, and mum can't get any control with dietary exclusion or she can't exclude, and they're not thriving very well despite the fact you've asked them to continue. So these are our cow's milk substitutes. So for those of you who don't understand the differences between the milks, um, do you think it would be useful to talk about them? Yes? Okay, all right, that's fine. So 
all, all milk is made out of protein. Okay, so this is a cow's milk protein on the end of the slide. Now you get partially hydrolyzed formula, so I will have to walk over if that's all right. You're not allergic to the whole of the protein. You're allergic to part of it usually. So let's say you could be allergic to this part, this part, or both. All right? So you're not allergic to the whole bit. You might be allergic to green bit, red bit, or both bits. So you get partially hydrolyzed formulas. Okay, so they're cut up a little bit, but you can see they're not cut up enough that those are separated. Therefore, you will still react. If you're a cow's milk allergic, react to that milk because you haven't cut it up enough. And one of the ones we have available is the um, HA infant milk by SMA. That's a partially hydrolyzed formula, but no good for children who are cow's milk allergic. So then you have extensively hydrolyzed formulas. These are cut up a little bit more. So the protein is cut up. And you can see it separated the red part now. So actually, about 95% of children should tolerate an extensively hydrolyzed formula. All right, because it's been cut up enough that a lot of those proteins won't be recognizable as cow's milk anymore. And this is where your Althera, Alimentum, Pepti, and Nutramagen come in. All right. The final one, the amino acid one, is where the proteins uh, cut up completely. So you can see now everything's being separated. All right. So you can't recognize it as milk anymore. And 100% of children should now be able to tolerate that milk. All right. And those ones are alpha amino, neocate, and pure amino that's available currently. All right. Does that all make sense? Yeah, does that help? Yeah, good. All right then. Other milks, well, we don't recommend soy milk for under six months old because there is a risk of cross-reactivity and also there's concern about phytoestrogen content affecting fertility. So above six months is fine. This child was four months, so you probably wouldn't go for a soy milk for this one. Goat's milk formula, again, not suitable. It's very similar to cow's milk, so they're likely to react. It's not got the right nutritional content. Rice milk, not under four years old. Again, we see kids coming in on rice milk at, you know, six, seven, eight months. It's got high levels of arsenic in it, so uh, it's uh, suggested to be avoided under four years old. Uh, we also have kids coming on camel milk imported from Egypt, all sorts, because no one's giving them the right advice because they're not being referred to appropriate uh, services. So avoidance is important and that's the key th message we always give. If you avoid it, you should have a problem. But obviously, if you do get exposure to that food, you need to recognise and treat the reaction. All right, so recognition is not just about telling the mum or the dad, it's about educating all family members who look after that child. So that's the grandparents, the uncles, whoever. It includes school staff, so that's really important. Giving them written treatment plans is really important. Stressing early treatment, not waiting to see what happens, which is often uh, they tell me, should we just wait to see what happens? I said, no, <laughs> okay. Uh, carry medications at all times, and we've just seen a very good uh, example of that on the video. Uh, thinking about medic alerts and uh, planning for overseas travel. A lot of our families obviously have relatives abroad. I can guarantee that most of the reactions I've had in the children I look after are abroad because the grandparents don't believe in allergy. So they say when, when the parents go out to do their shopping down in the bazaars of Dili, the grandparents get, oh, it's rubbish, just give them a cashew. And they probably have an anaphylaxis. All right. So, mild reactions. So I told you you'll have to think about what you would class. So, what would you class as a mild allergic reaction? What kind of symptoms would you put into that category? A mild rash. A mild rash? Yeah, what kind of rash? Tentacurus? Yeah. Good, yeah. What else? Vomiting. Vomiting, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, they can do, yeah. What else? Swelling. Facial swelling, yeah. Anything else? Silence, okay. <laughs> All right, so yeah, you got this. So flushing, itching, nausea, you may have an episode of vomiting, urticaria, cramps, lip eye swelling. And again, it's trying to get a, the parent to understand how to sort of recognize a mild reaction. So the way I do it, and you know, everyone does it differently. I use the teeth as my barrier. So I say anything in front of the teeth, so lip swelling, eye swelling, itchy rashes over the body, it's on the outside, that's a mild reaction you need to treat with an antihistamine, all right? So this is a little girl who's eaten, um, I can't remember what she'd eaten, but you can see she's got some swelling, itching, and not looking very happy, okay? So antihistamines, great, so reduce abdominal pain, reduce your hives, give a good amount of cover depending on which antihistamine you use. Because remember, adrenaline is to buy you time to get into hospital. All right, that's important to remember. So, severe reactions, how would you, uh, well, what symptoms would you put into severe reactions? Wheeze, yeah. Floppy. Floppy. Throat swelling. Throat swelling, absolutely. Yes, good, okay, a lot more people excited about the severe reactions. Yes, absolutely. So, this is the IACI guidelines, and basically it says exactly what you said. So, any respiratory or cardiovascular compromise, okay, it's very wordy, but that's what it's saying. So, this is symptoms behind the teeth, tongue swelling, Bring difficulty, wheezing, get rid of pain or drowsy. The reaction's now gone inside. You need 
to do emergency management. And they seem to always remember that, rather than me just saying a whole load of symptoms that they don't quite get. They always, when I come in, I say, well, how do you recognise? They say, yes, in front of the teeth, this Dr. Makwana, behind the teeth, this Dr. Makwana. So good, excellent. OK, so this is a little girl uh, going into coffee and wheezing. The parents are obviously taking photos quite nicely as she goes into anaphylaxis. <laughs> but she did survive, so that's all good. So all, all, all's well. All right. And the type of anaphylaxis you get will depend on what you're reacting to. So drugs and venoms tend to cause more cardiovascular anaphylaxis, whereas food tends to cause more respiratory anaphylaxis. Uh, and that's taking us back to the fact you need to have your asthma properly controlled. Because if you've already got problems with your lungs, you get an insult with an anaphylactic episode to food, you're more likely to get a severe respiratory reaction. The general feeling, and I know Hazel probably knows this from Richard's data, is that you should lie down if you have an anaphylaxis, okay? because there's more people who died sitting up of anaphylaxis than laid down. And that's probably to do with the hypotension and the blood going to the wrong places. But in children, because they're more likely to have food allergy and therefore respiratory anaphylaxis, we tend to say whatever, condition, whatever uh, position they're comfortable in, that's where they should stay. All right? So wherever they react, whether it be school, home, they should be in the most comfortable position for them. Again, why we're interested in paediatrics is because teenagers and young adults predominate in death series. And those are a number of studies, the most recent one from 2014, telling us exactly the same and it's still the same. And that's because as teenagers, of course, we know we're invincible. Nothing could possibly happen to us. So I'm not going to, yeah, they go out without their EpiPens or auto injectors. They go and eat food. They don't want to be different to their friends, so they want to eat the same thing. So they start you know, trying things. And that's why they have more reactions. So treatment is of anaphylaxis adrenaline, okay? There, it's there on this guideline, there, and all the other bits are secondary, okay? And yet we find, and it's not just in our hospital, but we've seen audits from other hospitals, that people will do everything but give I'm adrenaline, <laughs> all right? They'll give salbutamol, they'll give IV uh, antihistamines, they'll give steroids, but everyone's scared of giving IM adrenaline, all right? So we just had a big uh, campaign in our ED department to try and explain that that is a treatment for anaphylaxis. Don't do anything else, do that first. And it might be worth it if you, if you are working in hospitals to see what your own EDs are doing, because I think we've done it in a few departments and it's been exactly the same. Auto-injector brands, there's, uh, those are the three available to us, EpiPen, Jackson, Emirate, and there's the three doses uh, of the biggest one only being with Emirate at the moment, okay? And this is when we would be giving it, all right? So any previous anaphylaxis, basically, we would be given a, an auto-injector, all right? Because they're at much higher risk of having another anaphylaxis. Food allergy and asthma, we've already discussed the reasons why, and you can see the data supports that you're more likely to have a severe reaction if you've got asthma as well. If you've got exercise-induced anaphylaxis, so you never know quite how much exercise is going to trigger you, so that you have to have an um, auto-injector. And if you've got idiopathic, i.e. I can't tell you what to avoid anaphylaxis, you need to have an auto-injector. So that's the ones that I would definitely give auto-injectors to. And then there's sort of expert opinion, you know, any reaction to a small amount of food, any reaction to peanut or nuts. We do tend to give an auto-injector for that, and I think most places would. A remoteness from medical help. Generally in the West Midlands, we're okay, because we've got lots of hospitals, and everyone lives quite close to one. Obviously, if in the remote uh, sort of areas of Scotland, you may well need one. Uh, and teenagers and young adults, although they're the very people who don't carry it. So when they come into my clinic, have you got your auto-injector with you? It's in the car? And I said, is it really? <laughs> um, you know, so they're the very people who won't carry it. So uh, from my point of view, when I'm in my clinic, this is how I'm thinking about allergy, all right? So the first thing is to think about uh, making that family understand about how to uh, recognise and treat reactions, but most importantly, prevent reactions. And then over the longer term, we're teaching that young person as they go into adulthood how to assess their own risk, reduce their own risk, and the only way we can do that is making sure that they get the same messages from every professional they see. <coughs> this is an example of our allergy management plan. This is the BSACI we want. They say similar things. We quite like ours because we did it and it's nice colours. But um, the BSACI one is good as well. All right, and the referrals, um, it's very important, sort of, um, the NICE guideline gives very clear guidelines for referral into um, secondary care, of which most children who have had an IgE-mediated reaction should be, all right? Now, I'll, I'll take you back to Justin for a second. So Justin, obviously, remember, had that uh, peanut cracker and had a reaction. GP told him to avoid nuts, you'll be fine, all will be well. So four or five years later, he goes into McDonald's. Or was it McDonald's? No, it was one of, one of the fast food joints. And had a burger bun and promptly had anaphylaxis. All right? What do you think had happened? 
sesame seeds, absolutely, all right? So when he finally got referred, when we skin tested him, he was negative to peanut, but massively positive to sesame. And if you go back in the history, it was a sesame cracker with peanut butter on it. Yeah, which is why even if the history sounds really, really obvious, they do need to have at least one you know, one-stop review at an allergy clinic to make sure we've got it right. And obviously, this allergy clinic has been shown to improve knowledge of the parents, of the child, about how to manage and recognise reactions. And obviously, what we do over time is test them to determine whether their allergy has got better. So, a quick couple of slides. Have I got? How long have I got, Andy? Couple of okay, okay. Tell me just when to stop. <laughs> All right. So non IG mediated allergy, I think, is another referral we get quite a lot. And I'll take you to Jay in this case. So Jay is four months old. He's been referred to allergy clinic because he's had eczema from birth. All right. Mum stopped breastfeeding, changed her formula at four weeks of age. She uses creams, but they don't appear to help. And this is a very common referral. What is he allergic to? So this is what what comes into us. Okay. So what would you do, all right? So remember, there's the blood test you can do, there's skin tests you can do, there's other things you can do. So you could do some blood tests to common allergens to see if there's a problem. You could do a food panel specific IgE, which um, I'm sure Sally would be ecstatic about, you know, lots of, uh, lots of blood tests. Uh, change the eczema creams, discuss compliance with creams, refer to the allergy clinic for skin tests, because you can't do them in primary care, perform a food channel, uh, for, sorry, perform some blood tests and then refer to the allergy clinic. <gasps> which is a nightmare, and then something else. So what, what would you think people would do? Who would like to do A, do some blood testing? No, nobody. Uh, do even a wider range of blood tests? B, no. Change eczema creams? Yeah, some, yeah, yeah, okay, some eczema cream change, yeah. Discuss compliance with creams? Yeah, quite a lot of people, okay. Um, refer to the clinic at this stage? Yeah, some people would, all right. Perform some blood tests and then refer to the allergy clinic? No, okay, everyone said no. Anyone who's doing anything else that I've missed out? <laughs> Send them to dermatology, okay. <laughs> All right. So there is, again, a nice guideline looking at atopic eczema in children. And again, they make it very clear that food allergy should be considered absolutely in children with bad eczema who may have reacted immediately to a food. All right. Or inhalant allergy, so house dust mite, pollens, for example, where there's seasonal flares or there's associated airway problems as well. Okay? So that's when you should refer. But in this child, I would agree absolutely, we need to sort out these creams first, all right? Because I get so many referrals, as I'm sure you do, I'm sure Scott does. And I would say probably 75% of my eczema allergy referrals are just eczema. And actually, if once I get the treatment sorted, I don't need to exclude anything, I don't need to do any tests, all right? So this is a kind of uh, protocol we use for our children with eczema. We make sure they have a bath oil, they have some sort of sub substitute, they have a regular moisturiser, which they should be using at least four times a day. So I often get referrals, oh, this eczema isn't controlled with all the creams. When I ask a parent how often you're using it, they'll say, oh, once or twice a day. Well, it's not going to work then, all right? So you have to use it at least four times a day. And they're all as good as each other, is what I normally say. Uh, an appropriate strength steroid for your severity. So if you've got a really a child with really bad eczema, there's no point giving hydrocortisone, which is the milder strength. Okay, I would always go for the highest strength, get it under control so the parents can see that actually we can achieve control with creams and then step down quickly. All right? But often in primary care, it's in the other way. They start with the mildest one and then they move their way up, by which time the parents lost faith because it's not worked. Okay? And if they're particularly bad at night, you can always give a nocturnal antihistamine to sort of help them sleep. Okay, so this is, but in, from an allergy term, uh, some eczema is certainly flared up by foods. And we see it, you know, parents, but usually have identified it themselves before I even see them. They'll say to me, say, Dr. McQuire, every time I give a milk product, within six hours, his eczema is horrendous, you know, and it takes a two or three days to settle down. And that's very well recognized. But we don't really know what the mechanism of that is. So it does happen, all right? It's more common in children with other allergies. It does involve some sort of inflammation, but we don't quite know what. And because of that, we haven't got any test. And that's the problem. Okay, they come to me expecting a test. And I say, actually, I can't do a test because it's not that kind of allergy from what you've told me. And there's often associated symptoms because this is, again, a multi-system disorder. So they have reflux problems. They might not be growing very well. They have colic out of keeping with normal colic. They may have diarrhea. They have blood in the stool. Constipation, again, I get a lot of first with constipation. And the key thing in the story there is a child who's normally, in inverted commas, constipated, will strain and strain and strain and produce a really hard, pebbly poo. A child with constipation related to allergy will strain and strain and strain and produce a normal poo. 
right? Because it's a motility problem, and that's why they've got that constipation. And therefore, the treatment and the diagnosis is based on exclusion. All right. So there's another very good guideline um, that's been published, the MAP guideline, which goes through this non-IgE type allergy. And actually, it's very complicated, but what it tells you is basically avoid the food for four to six weeks, see if there's an improvement, put it back in for four to six weeks, and see if there's a worsening. And if there's an improvement followed by deterioration, that suggests non-IgE type allergy. All right. So that's the non-IgE. Um, obviously, you could talk for a whole hour on that, but actually that's a very simple way of thinking about it. I would probably skip the future bit, yeah, all right, so I'll whisk through, I'll just go, go, go through this. Um, is your data in there as well, Andy? Yeah, it's all right, is it all right if I missed it out? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the, the things I was gonna just cover in the future, this is just sorry, one slide, better packaging now. We've already got the highlighted in the um, bold packaging, which has now come in to make it easier. Um, there's new apps coming through, and I know Lorianne's involved with one called Food Maestro, which we find very useful. Evidence regarding when to wean what. You've probably heard about the LEAP study and the EAT studies coming out soon. Allergy prevention, so the milk I told you about, the partially hydrolyzed formula, if you start it very early in high-risk children, there's some evidence that you reduce the onset of eczema. We might have better diagnostic tests, so we have these component tests now, which can help us stratify risk of having a severe allergic reaction, for example, to nuts. And then we have immunotherapy, which if started early enough can prevent asthma onset, so that's pretty useful. And obviously specific tolerance induction to foods. So we already do milk and egg, and at the moment, obviously peanut is a big one that's uh, in the press, and we'll watch this space. So, there, as Linda said, there's allergy clinics around the country, but they're not often in the... Well, they're not distributed equally. We have a very good service here. Scott runs a very good service on the east side of Birmingham. And actually, like every other allergy service, we're happy to take calls from primary care, from school nurses, from health visitors, and we do get calls. And they're going up and up and up in number over time. So, the take home messages from today is if you suspect IgE mediated food allergy, please get them referred to an allergy clinic. And I know sometimes that the um, primary care GPs won't do that, and that's why, like Scott, we're seeing a lot of referrals from school nurses and health visitors coming through now. You should give written allergy management plans for the allergies, and if you give them an auto-injector, you must show them how to use it. All right? I only saw a child, two children actually, yesterday in clinic, both of them being prescribed an auto-injector, and when I asked, has someone shown how to use it, they said no. So it's like having a chocolate teapot then. Okay? And if you've got poorly controlled eczema, think about allergy, all right? And I think that's really important because there's other things you can do first, but there might be associated symptoms and you need to think about it. So that is a bit of a whistle-stop tour through paediatric allergy. Hopefully that's uncovered some myths, help you understand some areas you were uncertain of. But I think the key thing is working together, and that includes all the um, uh, charity companies, secondary care, primary care, tertiary care. If we get the diagnosis right, get the avoidance information correct, and that education is continued over and over again as they get older, understanding the need for immediate treatment actually saves lives, which is why I like allergy. I like food and I like plants as well, but I like saving lives. All right. So I'm hoping many of you may have started like that, but you hopefully will leave looking like that. All right. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, any questions? Okay, Paul. Uh, is this actually working? Can I just ask? Um, are the children that have eczema that also have food allergy in whom the eczema improves when they change their diet, do they tend to have kind of normal total serum IG concentrations high or sky high? Have you, do you have a feel for it? on the blood results anyway. But when we did used to do it, we saw all levels. So I've seen children with very severe eczema with very low levels of Ig, children with sort of mild to moderate eczema with 5,000, 6,000, but in the normal is sort of 240 or below. So it's very variable. But I think you're probably right. I think the probably the severe end do have higher levels, certainly. Thank you. So we've discussed uh, reluctance to use adrenaline amongst teenagers. So can you just tell the audience your experience of reported 
uh, use of adrenaline amongst your patients? Is it positive? What, what do they say about it? Does it work well? Do they, would yeah. they do it again? Yeah. So um, the ones that have used it, which isn't many actually, because I think we tend to avoid very well, but the ones who have used it, when they've got over that fear of doing it, they realise their symptoms are a lot worse, they get scared and they use it. And actually, none of them have felt it was the wrong thing to do. And afterwards, when I've spoken to them, well, how was it? They said, well, actually, it was all right. And actually, I felt better so quickly, I would definitely use it again. Um, to the point where there's one, I remember there was one child who had a cashew allergy whose sister was ironing. He's, her brother ate a cashew. He started swelling. He said, well, I feel a bit funny now. She got up, gave him the injector, and then carried on with her ironing. <laughs> And, and they told me when they came to clinic a few months later, yeah, yeah, I gave it to him. He was absolutely fine, and you know we're not ha we're not scared to use it. So I think I think I think it's getting over that initial hurdle, and that's what the, what the training in clinic helps with, just having a go at doing it. And now, or like you, probably send them home with a trainer pen, and I say practice every month, have a go every month. You know, first of every month, have a go. Make sure you don't forget, because I'm hoping you'll never need to use it. So you want to make sure that when you do have to use it, you don't have to think too hard about using it. You know, it's like a second nature. Thanks. Any other questions? So. Yes. In my area, patients, parents, patients have difficulty getting GPs to refer to an mm. allergist. So here, they're able to refer school health and health visitors. Yes, yeah, so they can I refer mean, directly. Absolutely. I think it depends on your area. From our point of view, and I think Scott's the same. We are happy to accept referrals from school nurses, health visitors, because at the end of the day, there's a child at the end of this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about oh, we can only accept referrals from this person. There's a child at the end of it. We will see and then take the consequences afterwards. Mm -hmm. But no GP who I've written to saying this was referred to me by a school nurse has ever come back and been upset or shouted at me for you know, prescribing things and asking him to continue prescribing them. Just, just sorry. Um, I don't need that. Just oh, can, can sorry, can you can you use the microphone? Because oh, do I? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I thought I thought you could hear me. Sorry. Um, uh, looking at the nice guidelines as well as listening to you, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously all of the information you're giving about symptoms. Certainly, what about ch a child then that presents with abdominal pain following eating something? Mm -hmm has a stool similar to you've said which does have some blood in it mm. but also has very very mild uh, eczema that does go away mm. would you suggest that child is referred to an allergist no and that's what the map guideline is saying so what the map guideline says if you suspect a non-ig type allergy you can do the exclusion and the reintroduction within the primary care setting, obviously with a dietitian involved, if you're going to exclude something. And then once you've confirmed the diagnosis, then it's very clear that you know you exclude it for a period of four to six months and then reintroduce again with the aid of a dietitian. So no, absolutely. So the non-IG ones, we don't necessarily expect to come to us at all. And that's what the MAP guideline says as well. The IGE ones, we would expect to come to us. Thank you. I was just going to say, following on from that, that's all very lovely if you've got a dietitian in the community. So mm. we don't have dietitians in the community, so we do get yeah. quite a lot of them coming through because that's the only way mm. they see the dietitian. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely right. So there are referrals that come through, really. The GP's made the right diagnosis, but they said we can't refer to the dietitian unless they're under a paediatrician. So then we get referral that way as well. So, uh, yeah, every area is different, and I think it's what works for your patch. <laughs> we have lots of children that come that have had clinical anaphylaxis, obviously not severe anaphylaxis, uh, and haven't used their EpiPen, so they've got away with it, so they don't need to use it next time. Mm. So trying to convince them that they've, you know, they got away with it. They, some people just splash water in their mouths and things, <laughs> rather than antihistamines, which is interesting. And we've also had a couple, so primary care can be an issue. We've had patients that we see that we don't see very often but they want to take them back rather than us seeing them into free, the, the complicated patients, they want to take them back. So presumably there is a, a pressure of, of money out there. Uh, and we do see all the, all the school nurse ones, but I do, you know, the GPs get charged for those. So I suppose mm, if they yeah, cottoned yeah, on, yeah. they may say no. Mm, mm. And that's what I'm saying. So I've not had one come back yet saying, why, how, why did you see this patient without my referral? But you absolutely, that's where the problem might lie, that they'll say, well, why did you see it? I didn't send it, it's my money. Hi, what happens at the top end of your age range? What do you do about transition? So um, we have a transitional clinic, so I run it with the adult immunologist. So there's uh, the children that we feel should be transitioned, who are either complex, problematic, aren't doing what they should be doing, we do a transitional clinic. So there's one that runs at this hospital and one that runs at Sandwell. So we do a, a transitional clinic cross-site. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Nick. Well done.
Take it off now.